Hello, you money makers, savers, hoarders, and if you're anything like us, spenders. Here on The Money Party, we don't just talk about budgets and financial planning. We also dive deep into the things that keep us from living a financially free life. From financial mindset to mental health and why we try to keep up with the Joneses. Or should we now say the Kardashians? On today's show, we have Matt Francina, the People's Advisor. We talk with Matt about a societal shift of ownership to access and how it impacts your assets. Matt believes big think will change the world, and he explains what that means. He walks us through his eight steps to financial freedom, from defining it and believing you deserve it to investing your money. Oh, and don't be surprised if you walk away craving your favorite bowl of cereal after this episode. Let's get this party started. On the show today, we have Matt Francina, who's a husband and father of three. He's a co-founder of Policy Engineer, and he's a licensed financial advisor. He is a member to the MDRT court table. And let's not forget to mention his love of the sun, and he's a serial lover. And he believes that Big Think will change everything. Matt, before we get started, I have a serious question for you. Yeah, what's that? What is your favorite cereal? Oh my gosh, I knew you might go there. I think the all-time favorite will go down like Honey Bunches of Oats. Like that's the, the, the goods no matter when and where. So I guess I'll have to stick with that one. But if we're going to like the real roots, then probably Golden Grams. Like if you want to get serious Whoa. back in the day. I forgot about that one. Oh, yeah. All right, all right. Let's move on to some Let's serious go. stuff. All right, let's move on. Cereal right. stuff. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Let's get cereal. All right, all right, all right, all right. Let's move. Let's move. That is certainly our lucky okay, okay. charm. <laughs> Stop. Stop. You, Lee could go on all day with this, so let's let's just move on. One thing that you said is you believe that big think will change everything, and so I'm like, what is what is that? What does that mean to you? I'm trying to understand that. I even went and did research. Maybe I'm the only person who doesn't really know what big think is. I saw there's a website. Um, explain that to me. I'm really curious. So. My opinion of big think is really just thinking constantly at a level that's beyond what feels natural. Um, I think that if you can put yourself in a position where whatever it is you're thinking about, you're thinking bigger than the norm, it's going to trigger creativity. It's going to trigger energy. It's going to put you in a position where striving towards something becomes worth it. Really starting to think big and out of the box and believe it was something that happened as I got more into business and got more into um, trying to build something, right? And I just realized like, why do I want to be building something that's small? I, I don't. And so I just think if people had bigger ambitions that they would try harder. And if they tried harder, even if they don't accomplish the big ambition, they're going to accomplish a lot more than they would have had they just been going on and trying to do the norm or what everyone expected them to do, which is not much more than the average. Yeah. And so anyways, I just think if you attach to like massive things, you might attract other people too that will help you get there. Um, when you're thinking normal, most people don't look and say, oh, well, I should help him and her, right? You guys want this to be the number one podcast in the world, the, the, the number one place where people come to be engaged in the money party, then you're probably going to get other people who are going to say, I like their concept and I can help. But if you say, we just want to start a podcast because we thought it would be fun and we would start it, but we have no ambition or care at all of where it goes, you probably don't get people saying, I got to come and help them blow it up. Sure. You never told anyone you wanted to blow it up. So why are they going to jump on that and help you? Yeah. So big think changes a lot of things because people want to get involved in things that are bigger than themselves. Yeah. Just so few people are willing to come up with ideas and commit to something bigger than just them. That's true. And it's often probably because of fear um, or uh, the imposter syndrome that we always Mm -hmm. talk about. You know, it's just uh, there's a lot of things. I'm always I'm reminded of the uh, quote from Office Space, the movie when he's like, you know, I work just hard enough not to get fired. (laughs) 
Yeah. And that's kind of like a mentality that a lot of people have with things. It's just like, hey, you know, I'm just going to like put what I can in so that I don't make waves and that's it. Move on and everything's yeah. great. But if you're looking to exceed and excel at things, you know, you have to have that big think. And I think, you know, I was just thinking like, well, what, do I have big think? I don't think I really do. But then, you know, when we sold our house, we totally had big think. It was just like, yeah. we want to sell our house for way more than we think it, than what anybody tells us it's worth because we think it is. Mm -hmm. And we found a realtor who actually believed that with yep. us, just like you said, she was on yeah. board because she's like, hey, I want to help these people. And uh, yeah, totally worked out. So I, I see that I've, we've experienced that in real life, like happening. So yeah, it's a great example. Yeah. yeah, and it can happen. And even if you didn't sell your house for the number one sale price ever in your neighborhood, you probably got more than you would have if you just listed it and were like, ah, whatever. And, you know, so I think it, it, moves a lot. And one thing you said, you know, about um, office space in that line, that's a huge problem. The They say that the hardest thing for anyone to change or to get out of in their life is their socioeconomic class. That that is the almost an like predestined where you came from is where you'll end up. The percentage of people that get out of that and move to the next realm and it is so small, but a lot of it is because the example of what they're taught, their parents go to work and say, I work hard enough just to not get fired. And they see that as normal. And then that's what they unintentionally end up becoming. And so, I mean, I, I hope and pray that my kids see me and they look, whether it's like they know it's happening or not, they are becoming someone that is molded into thinking wherever we are, we can be content with it, but our energy should be striving towards the next level. That's yeah. what we always saw dad do. That's what yeah. mom and dad wanted for us, you know? And so big think will help people get out of that. I think that's huge. Yeah. It's big. <laughs> really makes me think. We, no, should, just, we should call it huge think. <laughs> Take it one step further, Matt. <laughs> Huge big thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Matt. So I want to get to the real reason why we're having this, this conversation today. And it's about financial freedom. And we want to know, what does financial freedom mean to you? Really simply, I think financial freedom is when you have enough passive income to cover the lifestyle that you're happy with, the lifestyle that you want. So I used to think financial freedom was enough money to buy the things I wanted when I had the urges to want to buy them. And if I wanted something, I could get it. But I then later realized that real financial freedom was when you could do that and you didn't have to wonder where you were going to get the funds from to be able to do that, that you already knew that it was coming in. And I didn't get exposed to that until I got into the industry. At 23 years old, I was recruited into the insurance industry. I got my insurance license. Shortly after that, I got my financial advisory license. And I started getting exposed to people who were well older than me. And fortunately, the company I started with was really focused on working with retirees. So most of my clients were in their 60s and 70s. They were already at that, like, wherever the destination was they were trying to get to, right? They were pretty much there at that point. My exposure to people who were able to live the lifestyle they dreamed of from their own assets that they accumulated over time was to me like this unlock that even if they're at that age, you could do the same thing at any age, really, right? And so I want to just, gosh, I want to spread the word and give people permission to believe that financial freedom, first off, is this concept where you don't have to worry about where money's going to come from. You just have to maintain whatever it is that you've built and it'll continue to pay you. That's financial freedom. But also the permission to think of what does the life look like that you want to have financially free, to have that, that freedom. And that's the thing, again, it goes back to that whole concept of like big think. 
I think a lot of people think of financial freedom as if I could just have the, the way I live today and know where the money was coming from, then you know I'd be okay. And they mistake that for a good job, right? They mistake having uh, an employer that's going to give them the amount of money every month that they need to pay for the way that they live is financial freedom. Well, we know that 2020 took a bunch of people out at the knees that thought that they had financial freedom, but they didn't. They just had a job that they liked that paid them above average. So they thought, okay, I can make it happen. But if you're not in true control of the ability for that money to keep paying you, you don't have ultimate financial freedom. You just have it a little bit better than somebody else did. Yeah. And so long answer to your question, but also, though, I see that there's a um, you may have to get out of your comfort zone. Um, you may have to change your current lifestyle in order to get on that track of financial freedom. Right. I mean, you can't say say you're living beyond your means right now. You can't suddenly stay there and then just all oh, just make more money. Right. There might be those times where you have to like, hey, I got to cut back on this. I got to take that out. I got to remove this from my life. Right. In order to get on track towards that financial freedom, you're going to have to make changes if you're not there um, or have patience. Even if you're making all the right decisions, that freedom doesn't come overnight. It's going to take time. And and you know, when I go over these eight steps that my brother and I have come up with that, we believe are eight stages essentially to acquiring financial freedom you're going to have strategy in there. You're going to have to end up making changes and doing stuff like that. But you'll start to see the fruits of your labor. You can be financially free of your car payment. If you have enough assets that you can get income from your assets to just cover your, um, your car payment, well, you're financially free of that now. And the idea is to continue layering on top more and more the assets that can cover your expenses. And um, one thing I don't know if people are paying attention to, but I know that our generation has lived through this shift. And I think we have been the ones to, to sort of like cause it to happen, but we've gone from ownership to access. It doesn't matter if you own a car, you can Uber wherever you go, or there's all these ride sharing services, right? You don't have to own movies anymore. You just pay a subscription. You don't have to own music anymore. You just pay a subscription. So this concept of just paying to have access to stuff has taken over to like almost everything. This stuff is taking place. But with the idea that we're more concerned with access than ownership amplifies how much more important it is to have assets that cover your access because if not, you'll never be able to not work. What happens when you reach a time, if you don't own anything and you have access to everything, but it costs you money, you can't ever quit the thing that was paying you. So we need financial freedom and we need the navigation system to get us to that place now more than ever. And it's only going to get worse and worse or more important and more important as the generations evolve, because that's the direction we're going. People want access to stuff, not ownership of stuff. Wow. That's a really great point. And I, I struggle with this too, with the access to things, mm -hmm. you know, you no longer have the thing anymore. So where's your, where's your investment? Where's your equity? You know, um, right. you're entertained by a movie cause you've bought it and you can watch it anytime, but you know, with a Netflix subscription, yeah, you can watch it anytime, but as long as that money keeps coming to support it, it, it it's right. It never amortizes. <laughs> right. But the thing is there isn't any equity in it. So you can't like trade it and get some of that money back where people make the big mistake is, oh, this thing that would have cost me a thousand dollars is now costing me. $99 a month. So I have 900 other dollars I can go get other stuff with, right? And then they go get other stuff. When realistically, the concept should be the difference between the cost of ownership and the cost of access, that delta needs to go into something that pays you in the future. So 
I just want to challenge people to think about money in a way where like it's a tool. And when you go to work and you get a paycheck, you're getting tools. You're getting like bolts and nails and screws and all these things to go construct something. But a lot of us don't use it that way. Yeah. So hopefully this conversation and many more that end up happening and what you guys are doing with the money party starts to inspire people to think of money as something like a tool. That's great. I'm like self-reflecting here and trying to. (laughs) I'm getting mad at all my subscriptions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like we need to start cutting <laughs> stuff right now. <laughs> well, like, I mean, for example, the tools I use for work, you know, it's a software based subscription instead of buying, you know, the software used to be really expensive, you know, a thousand dollars say for the exam yeah. for the software. And then every year a new version would come out, but people right. would pirate it and all that stuff. So they made it this subscription type system where you can like uh, hand select which tools you want. So you don't have to pay for all of them. You can only pay for what you need, but, Ultimately, here we are, um, five years, I've done that at, uh, let's say, $200 a year, Yeah, you know, we're already like, well over what it would have cost to just buy the software in the first place. Yeah, I mean, there's there's no end, right? There is no end. And now that it's altered, it's going to go that way forever, probably. So the thing is, I mean, if, if anyone were to pull up their phone and look at all the subscriptions they have on their iTunes account or Google store, whatever, you know, you look at all of these reoccurring expenses, how many reoccurring revenue streams do you have? Yeah. And, and could, That's eye-opening. Can, can you match them up? And if, I mean, most people aren't going to have it today. I mean, like I have more subscriptions than I do reoccurring revenue streams because I keep finding things we need for our business, right? <laughs> we just bought this big CRM system that we're, we're fully building out and utilizing for marketing and strategy, all these things. Then I hired a person to help us with that. And then, so like, they're not subscriptions, like I'm hiring people, they're wages, but it's an ongoing expense that's not going to ever go away as long as they continue working. But I'm consciously thinking, how are we going to take this effort and energy, free up time so my brother and I can go and execute on a new revenue stream? And people do not think about it that way. How do you, and revenue streams don't mean you need two jobs, three jobs, four jobs. Um, I don't know, but there's not a lot of like really well off rich people that have five jobs. They go clock in and clock out to <laughs> yeah. there's not right. They might have five businesses that they own that other people clock in and clock out on. But yeah, this idea of really auditing yourself, how many subscriptions do you have? How many reoccurring revenue streams do you have? It could be That's as simple really as, opening. yeah, it could be as simple as buying a stock that pays a dividend. And you know, well, every quarter I have this much reoccurring or what, there's a lot of ways you could you know, look at it, but. Yeah, definitely. Well, Matt, what would be a great stock for us to invest in right now? <laughs> um, that's a perfect tee up for, uh, shoot me a text, the DM, call me, reach out to me at the people's advisor. Let's set up a one-on-one and I'll, I'll give you some advice on that. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Just kidding. Just kidding. No, but the thing I can say is invest. Yeah. Become an investor. I mean, if you're listening to this and you don't have anything you're investing in, then start. What you should invest in, I can't break that down right now because this show will live forever and it may not be relevant a year from now. True. But the fact that you should be an investor way, way more consciously than a consumer is something that everybody needs to take away. So many times I've been sitting at the table with people talking about their stocks and how well they're doing and like, and I'm embarrassed that I hadn't invested yet. And I'm all like, oh, yeah, yeah, I got I got a stock of that. Yeah, it's glad it's doing great, you know, totally full of shit, because (laughs) I feel embarrassed that I haven't invested and I'm the one buying the Starbucks coffee and stuff like that. And it's just like, one day it hit me when it was when the um, uh, GameStop stuff was soaring. I was just like, I don't have any of like, how do I get started? I'm very curious into this. So like, you know, that's when I started researching Robin Hood and acorns and all that stuff. And it's really easy to get started. It's really easy. And don't be afraid yeah. to just take the first step, like just research. How do I buy a stock? Yeah. Or how do I begin investing? And, and I would say like investing is this world that opens up a can of worms. That's crazy. Right? Like I think people are fearful because they they're like, well, what if I lose money? Mm -hmm. 
it's all good. You, I mean, that's a true statement and you should be prepared that there's going to be a roller coaster involved. If you're investing, there's a, a learning curve. And if you're not willing to do that, then defer that to a professional then. It becoming an investor doesn't mean that you have to become, you know, the one to know it all and to do it all. Some people have 401ks. They don't put any money in the 401k. Am I saying 401k is the number one place to put the money? No, not necessarily, but it's better than blowing it all on Starbucks if that's what you do. And I'm okay with you buying coffee if you can afford coffee and have coffee, but look at things and say, well, okay, I'm buying a coffee. I spent five bucks on that today. Can I also take $5 and go and invest it somewhere? You know, that's why these like rounding up concepts of acorns. And um, there's another one out there. I forgot the name of it, but it'll buy stocks in the companies that you slid your debit card to purchase. So it actually knows where you spent it. It buys stocks in Target if you shop at Target. There's a million ways to do it. And stocks aren't the only place to invest. You can get involved in real estate. You can get involved in a business. You could start your own business. I mean, my number one personal investment is our company. I, I pour everything I have and all my money on it because if I'm trying to sell it for $10 billion, that's the number <laughs> one investment I could possibly put the money into. I believe in it. I'm really excited to hear about your, your eight steps to financial freedom. So why don't you get us going on that? Yeah. So- before I go into the eight steps, I just want to preface it with this. Everybody needs to think of their lifestyle, everything that makes up the way that you live from the car you drive, the house you live in, the experiences that you and your family have. I want you to, to close your eyes for a second while you're listening to this and just imagine all of those things are sitting on top of a table with four legs. There are four legs that are propping up the way that you live. And those four legs are essentially underneath the four most common pressure points that cause difficulty in your lifestyle. So we've all been to a restaurant before, might have been a while, but we've been to one where you sit down and all of a sudden you're like, how's this table have one shorter leg? Like, <laughs> right. And the table's wobbly. And now, depending on where you're sitting, you're now that person who needs to pay attention because if you put your elbow down on the table, you're <laughs> yeah. knocking everyone's water over, right? Yeah. And so even if one leg is shorter, it's inadequate for the job. And if it were missing completely, you'd actually have to shift everything on the table over to that corner opposite of the missing leg, hopefully to hold enough weight down on that leg. But enough pressure comes in the empty spot it's going to topple over and you're left picking up all the pieces, right? And right. so this concept of your lifestyle on top of this table, well, it's supported by your financial freedom. If you have enough money that's coming in, regardless of whether you go to work or not, these pressure points sort of get eliminated. Until you get there, you've got to make sure that you have something propping up all four of those corners. And the more expensive your lifestyle is, the taller that table becomes. You know, you think of like uh, Mike Tyson when he went bankrupt, right? And, and, and he, he blew all this money. His life changed a lot more than somebody who went bankrupt who was only making $50,000 a year. Like the, the level, the scale. So with that said, think of that first, right? My life lives up on this table propped up by four legs, and I'll get into the four legs in just a second. So these eight steps, though, if you want financial freedom. I think you need to go through these eight things. And there's it's almost impossible that you won't get there as long as you live long enough and you stay consistent with it. The first thing is you need to define it and believe it. OK, define what you think financial freedom is and believe you deserve that. If you don't believe that you deserve this thing that you're saying is financial freedom, you'll be stuck where you are forever because people won't work hard through tough times for something that they don't believe they deserve. So give yourself permission that you deserve it. Whatever it is that you believe that you want, that's how you define financial freedom. You deserve it. You need to believe that. Yeah. I struggle with that. I struggle with the idea of not deserving um, in many different aspects. And uh, that's so important. I mean, for me, um, it was 
It was uh, getting into this industry that made a significant change because it exposed me to other people who had it. And then I thought, well, why, why? They're not better than me. They're, they're older. They've worked longer. Maybe they made, um, you know, very hard decisions, but they're not better than me. They don't, I'm a human. They're a human. I deserve it just like they deserve it. Yeah. And it also exposed me. Like I don't come from a millionaire family. I come from, you know, humble background. We, we lived a good life and childhood, but nothing like lavish and extravagant. And when I started getting exposed to millionaires and they would open their portfolios and show me, and I'm like, I remember the first time I had a, a seven figure transaction, I was sweating. I couldn't even sign my name. I was like, uh. and I'm like thinking in my head, I hope he doesn't notice that I can't even write my name. Cause I'm like, Oh my God, this is the craziest thing. Now it's totally normal. And a lot of people don't get exposure to that. So if you're listening to this, just know it's out there and it's just regular average Joe's can have it too. There's millionaires next door. And um, so anyway, step one, define it believe you deserve it. The second step is set the table, take an inventory. What's that table look like? Like if you've never thought of everything you have on the table, what are the pieces you could be left picking up if it weren't set properly? Take an inventory of everything that you have. So we do this in a really structured way and we work on um, building full financial plans for people where we're taking a super specific inventory, right? What's everything you have that's worth something? What's everything you have that costs something? What's all of your debts? What's all? And you really take a full inventory to look at what do you have, right? And then once you look at what you have and the way your life is today, you're going to find some stuff you have you don't even need. You don't even care about. Your It's a waste. Um, and then you're going to have some things that you're going to be like, gosh, I thought we had more of this and we really don't. That might be time, that might be experiences, that might be money or material things. I don't know, but it's going to give you an eye-opening experience to really lay it all out in front of you. That's step two, just take an inventory, set that table. The third step is now start planning what's the future supposed to look like. We know where we are now. What do we want the future to look like? You sit down with the the people on your team, the closest one to you, the ones that are going to help you get there. And that desired future should also include who do you want to be a part of it in the future? When you think about how my, how your future is going to look, you should incorporate who are those people. And then during that same time, really of the inventory, you should also be inventorying the people in your life. Those that are closest in take up the majority of your time. Do you want all those people in the future? This might be an opportunity for you to cut some relationships out. It may be an opportunity for you to look and say, wow, I don't actually have any relationships. When I took inventory of all the people close to me, I didn't have any relationships that were actually people that were where I'm trying to get. So like, I don't have anyone in my circle that's an example and has the habits and the things that I, I need because they're already there or at least a little bit ahead of me. And so designing what you want the future to look like is important. That's essentially like the goal, right? You're like, all right, that's where I'm going to get. In my opinion, go far out. 20 years. Um, I could definitely get into a uh, in a, a tangent, what we call it, a, a, a Lee tangent. Uh, I, uh, Lee railer. Lee <laughs> railer, yeah. So don't let me get Lee railed. But um, in 2017, I set a goal for myself that was 20 years out. And I started, you'll see, I hashtag it sometimes. And I talk about 2037 mindset, 20 years from 2017, where would I want to be? What would that look like? And that was the goal. And it was big and it's, it's gotten bigger, never smaller. And I've done a lot of things to, to remind me of that every day and borderline obsessed with what do I want my life to be designed like then. And like every day, my actions should be doing something, getting me a little bit closer because I now know where I'm trying to go. So that's step three is design your future. Four is stabilize the table. Um, I came from the insurance world, so I probably have a biased point of view of this, but I want to assess and manage risk. And so if you design the future, you have those four things I was talking about earlier, the four corners, which are health, independence, income, and legacy. Those four things, they're your, your, if something happens in these areas, they're the number one thing to pull you backwards. 
So when I say stabilize the table is number four, it's basically ensure yourself against the risks you can't afford. Make sure you have the right kind of health care and you understand what the costs are involved with it if you need to use it. Make sure that if you couldn't work, you can maintain independence because you have disability insurance to, to pay, replace your paycheck, right? Your income, be planning for how that income is able to support these things and how eventually it'll become passive. And your legacy, if you and your family are set on these big goals and everyone's on a mission, it's very unlikely that one person is carrying all of the weight, right? You and your spouse and maybe your kids are all sort of involved and hopefully believe in this destination you're trying to get to. Well, what happens if the driver of the vehicle that was taking us to that destination is injured or even worse, passes away prematurely? Does the family still deserve to live out that life that they all dreamed up together? Yes, of course. I think yes, <laughs> right? And so that legacy item, that's life insurance, that's being prepared that if you prematurely were to pass, is there enough money that's going to create that financial freedom that everyone was chasing together? Because if you're gone, it's going to make it harder for the rest of them to get there. And life insurance isn't going to like replace the person but it can replace their income and at least make the destination you were going to try to get to um, a little bit easier. So stabilizing the table, you got four things, make sure they're stable. If you're fortunate enough to have built enough assets, you have enough money and reoccurring revenue coming in that all those things are covered without needing to leverage insurance. Great. You're listening to this podcast at a time in your life where you're you're way down the road already. You've made a lot of good decisions and there's maybe not a whole lot distance left to go. But if you're someone who's like, dude, I need to start investing. I would suggest even before you start pouring money into investments, look at and say, how do we make sure that if anything happened that was going to derail us, we could at least live the same life we're already at now. I know we want to go forward, but how do we protect from ever going backwards? And that's something that gets skipped by a lot of people. Step five is to build a blueprint. It's actually to come up with like the, the instructions of like, what is it I'm going to do? What are the steps? How do you make it happen? And I would say that either partnering with a professional or investing the time. See, a lot of people want to start investing and think investing is only money. Typically, investing is going to start first with time, right? They say time is money. So invest your time first. And it will give you money to then replace that time. And that's what the blueprint is there for. We help people build these blueprints. At the end of the show, I'm going to give people a link they can go to to um, actually start this process at no cost and start going through these stages of unpackaging their inventory and building this blueprint and doing all these things. But you need a blueprint. It's so important to have a blueprint because if you just aimlessly try to get there, it's not going to work. Um, there's a really, really great thing. It changed my life when I listened to it. Um, it's called the strangest secret in the world. You can get it on like Spotify or, um, iTunes music or anything like that. And the strangest secret in the world is this talk that's given by, uh, the name will pop up in my head in a second, but he talks about how if a boat in a Harbor were unanchored, and it had no direction and no one steering it, it would never make it to its destination, right? It would just float around and likely crash into the wall and, and sink. But a ship 999 out of a thousand times will get to its destination if there was a set out destination with a captain steering that ship to get there. It'll almost always get there. And so that's kind of the same concept behind this. A lot of, I think a lot of people skip straight to step five, like, Hey, I need to make a change. How? And it's like, you, you're missing a lot of stuff that you have to really address and think about before you get to the how. For sure. And I'm so glad you said that because, you know, I've had so many people, I sit down and I'm on a, an appointment with them and I'm going to be consulting around, you know, finances and um, building this plan. And I start asking questions and these are impatient people and they're like, no, 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 just tell me, tell me what to do. How much does it cost? Where do I put the money? And I'm like, you don't understand. I don't understand yet where we're trying to go. Like, I can't, that's like getting in a car, in a, in a cab and saying, all right, cabbie, take me where I want to go. 
<laughs> They're like, okay, where are we going? You tell me, I want to go there. Oh, where? You know, I, I want to go somewhere fun. Oh, really? Okay. You know, that's what it's like when uh, you look at an advisor and you're like, I want financial freedom. Great. What's it look like to you? And so a lot of people skip these steps. And that's, you know, our mission at Policy Engineer is to help people get exposed to what they need so they can start acquiring financial freedom. And so the last three, um, this is where we actually start putting in work, right? So step six is resources. You need to look at what your resources are. This is where you're going to start cutting expenses, canceling subscriptions, things like that. If you're talking about financial freedom and acquiring assets, you need resources to go get those assets, which is money, right? So you you need to look at and say, okay, what are my resources and how can I get more of them? Does that mean you're going to get another job, start a side hustle, sell stuff that you don't need, uh, end subscriptions so you have more money? But you need to analyze like, where's the fuel to burn this fire? And, you know, so you got to figure out where you're going to chop the logs down from and you got to go put them in there. So resources is number six. Number seven is assets, like actually deciding where you're going to put the resources. Do you want to be a real estate investor? Do you want to invest in the stock market? Do you want to invest in private equity? Do you want to start your own company and invest in that yourself? Are you a Bitcoin person? Do you want to invest? Like, I don't know what it is. Um, I mean, you can invest in anything. You could buy pork bellies. Literally, you can invest (laughs) in the future cost of pork belly. So like, you can invest in almost any category. Step seven is now like, I got this money. I have those resources. Where do I deploy it? And you might need some help and you might invest time first and then money. And then step eight is just repeat, repeat until you reach the target. And so it's, there's really seven steps, but the eighth one is repeat and re go through these because By the time you get to the place where you actually have found the asset that you're putting money into, when you get to that point, I bet if you go back around and you go, all right, let's look at step one again. How do I define financial freedom? I can almost guarantee you it's going to be different than the first time you defined it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it. Those are the eight steps. And if you take those away and you define it and believe it, set the table, design the future, stabilize the current situation, have a blueprint. Go deploy resources into assets you believe in. I think you'll become financially free. That uh, last step, number eight, repeat. I think that that's really important because first off, money is a huge element of life, right? That's just the reality of it. It's a big part of life. And it's really easy for whether it's money, whether it's a professional goal, whether, you know, whatever it is, it's easy to set it and forget it and walk away. And one thing that's the hardest thing to do is to go back and reevaluate. Okay. This is what I said I wanted to do. Where am I at? What do I need to do moving forward? Right. And so that's one of the hardest things to do. Just, I think naturally it's hard to do. We get so busy, but I think it's so important that you go back and you go, okay, what'd we say we were going to do? How do we make these adjustments? I like how you're like, your definition is probably going to change. Right. And so it that better change. It, right? it, yeah. yeah, I would hope it would change, especially because that I think that tells you you're making progress. Right. If that definition yeah. starts to change. And so I think that is just super key in any aspect of life. Always going back and saying, hey, let's revisit this. Mm-hmm. What's changed? What do we need to do moving forward? And uh, the more you the bigger you think in the beginning. Right. I think the less it will change but your strategy towards it will. That was like you're a big old bowl of life cereal right now. Right? <laughs> right? Yeah. I was going to say that was almost as good as your, your uh, lucky charm comment. Right? <laughs> you know, Matt, I, when we, at the beginning, we talked about what financial freedom means to you. And I think I'm in a very similar boat with you when you need to have the means to support your lifestyle. But I think there's a whole nother side, at least to me, because I know with everyone, it may be something a little different. Um, the other side of financial freedom to me is, is mindset and, um, the, like your, your mindset and the way you think about money. And a lot of that may come from the way that you were raised. It could come from mental health. And so that's another aspect of financial freedom. And if I can just start to change my mindset, I have a scarcity mindset when it comes to money. And if I can start to change that and look back at the way I grew up and not use that as an excuse 
or what I was taught and not use that as an excuse. Do you have any advice there? Just sit down and say, step one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, start writing. Writing it down is going to kind of force you to to make it a reality in the sense of like you're seeing it, you're feeling it, your your mindset will go and get into that place. Um, That would be my first suggestion is to do that. And also to, um, I mean, it's tough. You, you have to believe you have to have that belief. I mean, that is what unlocks everything. My first, um, I think, like moment where this belief thing happened. I used to be told by friends and family and people like, dude, you work too much, chill, relax, this and that. Like when I was kind of coming up in my career and I came across a Gary Vaynerchuk video that my brother shared with me. And it's him talking to the entrepreneurial um, class at USC, I believe. And if you've ever seen it, it's like, he's just kind of ripping this classroom a new one in a good way, but just getting passionate. And he was talking about working like till your eyes want to bleed is okay. If you're doing it for something that's like worthy and you feel like it's okay to put in that time, it's what's going to like move the needle and get you beyond where you feel you're stuck. And when I heard him say that, I was like, Oh my God. Like I felt like I had permission to tell all these people, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. I don't need to chill. I don't need to do this. It's okay. If I do that, I'll work this much. I'm going to do that. You have to find something. Maybe it's me saying it now, or maybe it's like an affirmation from somewhere else, but you got to give yourself permission to believe that, that like, it's okay to go further and bigger and to deserve more. I think that that's like the unlock. I don't know how to do it for everyone, but that's the step number one. Yeah. Yeah. You deserve it. You deserve it. You know, as you were saying this, I thought in my mind, you know, really the ultimate true, true definition to financial freedom is time. You have time because if you have money, you can have time. When you have financial freedom, you're going to have time. There's a guy, um, I don't know if you know, Ed Milet. He has a great podcast. And I heard him say on an Instagram live one day that, Rich means you have money, but being wealthy means you have time. I heard him say that. And I've heard that before too. I was mind blown and just like, whoa, dude, he's, that's the differentiator right there. And he's on his boat driving on a lake (laughs) at like 1130 in the morning while doing this like live. Right. And he's like, I have time. I I knew when I started to be able to just totally live on my own terms and spend my time how I wanted to. Um, that was when I realized I was wealthy. And I was like, wow, wow. I, I have not reached that status yet because my calendar consists mostly of executing to make money, to grow the business. Eventually though, I hope it's planning. So you have to start somewhere, to- right? <laughs> of course, right. <laughs> yeah. So I hope that answered your question. No, I think that's helpful. Um, I think you're right. It goes back to you believing, believing that you deserve it. Yeah. And there's a lot of, like you mentioned earlier, the, the socioeconomic aspects to all of our lives that I think, you know, subconsciously weigh on our decisions and our abilities to, uh, think big and move forward and grow and like, even feel like we deserve it. Yeah. Financial freedom. Uh, you know, why should we be successful if our parents are not, or we're not, um, that kind of vibe. Uh, why should we rise above uh, friends in our circle? Um, if it's if it's what you want and you feel like you deserve it, then go for it. Yeah, for sure. I think that so many of us like unintentionally adopt the habits of like whatever your surroundings are. That's what's normal. And then there's a few people who look at what they see and say, "This doesn't have to be normal." The, I, I believe there could be more. And you start to look at the way decisions are made around you as the evidence you need to do the opposite of it. But we all have probably had that moment, especially if you're a parent where you're like, I was told that by my mom once, yeah. right? Or I remember when my dad would say that and it just came out of your mouth and you're like, wow, I'm literally becoming them. <laughs> Right. And so like, it's, it's okay for some stuff, but I think if more of us made a conscious decision 
to pinpoint things, especially around money, pinpoint things about the people who are our leaders by default, our parents and our, our close family members and say, it doesn't have to be that way. You often complain about this. You never have money. You're always doing that. Like those are all things I'm not going to let me get stuck in. And then your gracious, kind words or your wonderful banana bread. I'll take those things as like what I do and how I act like you. Right? <laughs> yeah. How do you know my mom makes delicious banana bread? <laughs> you know, I was just putting it out there, but we can trade. My mom makes killer pumpkin bread. So oh. send me a loaf. I'll send you one. <laughs> and then we can uh, we, we can have a, um, a vote off. Perfect. I'll tell you what. I've got a loaf subscription. Um, oh, instead, of, <laughs> instead of trading me a loaf, you can subscribe to my loaf subscription. I love it. For a small fee <laughs> and all the loaves you want. Perfect. Before I do that, I just need to know the subscription costs because I got to put money in an asset to cover my subscription first. That's Good thinking. Fair. Good thinking. That's uh, fair. Hey, Matt, I know we're running out of time and we want to spend so much more time with you. And again, hope we get you on later. But I do have a final question for you. And we would like to yeah. know what is one of your big money moments that you've had in life and what did you learn from it? So being like a, a money guy, right? Like talking about it a lot, I've had quite a few of them, but I'll tell you that there's one that sets apart in my life more than anything else. Um, it happened to me in 2010. I was so tired of struggling. I, I wanted to, I was still living at home and I was new in my career. I just like money was constantly a challenge to me. And um, I, so I grew up in the church. I'm a Christian. And for me, like there was always this concept of tithing and giving money. And it was always like a struggle for me. I had this moment where I had this huge deal that was potentially coming through and I didn't have any money. I was like negative. I had debt. I wouldn't know where I was going to pay my car payment. And I remember just like having a moment with God and saying like, look, I will never not just give my commitment and I'm going to, I'm going to give up my fear of not having enough. And I'm just going to go. The deal closed. I was able to tithe and I committed at that moment. And I never have stopped since then that, that I'm going to give the 10% that I believe in my faith is what I'm supposed to do. And I'm never going to question where it's going to come from. And for me, it was the, the release of the fear. I gave up the fear in that moment is what it was that if I am willing to just use 90% of what I get with my own brain, and I'm not afraid of what this 10% difference would be. I was literally so afraid that like, how could I give up 10%? And when I was able to do it and I committed to it, I, I, the fear went away that like, where would money come from? I just, I, I was no longer worried about it for me and who I am and where I've come from. Like, and I believe it for everybody, but it was the greatest unlock where I could just anxiety shed off of me and it's never come back um, the way that I had it. And so that was my moment. That's really big. That's um, I mean, one of the, the best things they say that you could do, right. As you're managing and working through your money and, and um, no matter how much money you have is to give, even if it's just a little bit. And the more you okay. give, the more you get. Is what yeah. They say. Yeah. The more you yeah. give, the more you get. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and it's like, there's a lot that comes with that, but I think so many people have a fear of, of like scarcity. Right. And when you can actually make a commitment like that, it starts to open things up more. Like I then start to think, okay, well, how much do I actually have to live off of? Right. Cause I can give 10 here. Can I actually maintain my life off of 30% of my income? And 70% goes towards um, faith and impacting others and, and giving and maybe to my business and investing in all these things. And it, it unlocked that for me, this percentage thing that like you get X amount of dollars, how much of it are you allocating towards your day-to-day -day necessities? Almost all of us allocate all of it to that. Yeah. And 
So anyway, there's a lot of moments. And if we get a chance to have this conversation again, and I get proposed the question again, I'll have another one. There's quite a few, but that was the most impactful, I think, in my psyche and, and in my life. That's okay. awesome, Matt. Um, we've had a great time talking with you. I hope a lot of people uh, gained a lot of info. I'm sure we did. Um, the eight steps are incredible. You had mentioned you were going to provide us with a little workbook and some steps uh, yeah, free of for charge sure. for us to check out. But why don't you fill us in on uh, what you're going to leave us with and how people can get in touch with you if they have uh, more questions after you've done steps one through four, of course. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> reach out so, to me. <laughs> yeah. First thing, subscribe to the Money Party Podcast. This has been awesome. I'm super stoked to be on here. So if you're listening to this, you've made it this far, I guarantee someone else is going to come on here that's going to benefit you. So hit the subscribe button, then take a minute, go and uh, policy engineer, at policy engineer and at the people's advisor. You can find me anywhere online at those two handles, but go to policyengineer.com slash financial freedom and you're going to get an opportunity to start building out your financial plan. Financial advisors all across the world charge people good money for their hours and their time to go into this. If you're listening to the money party, you want to be a part of the money party, go to policyengineer.com slash financial freedom, and we're going to give it to you at no cost. Just go in there and register and start building out the modules that are in there, and you're going to get a financial plan from us and a dedicated one hour consultation, zero cost. So that's amazing. I'm excited to get Still started. Get started. <laughs> yeah. I have hockey today. Otherwise <laughs> I do it right now when we get off. <laughs> well, just make sure when, when you get checked into the boards that you go just as hard to whoever it was when you get them back. All right. Okay. It's you that's playing, right? No, no, it's my son. Sorry. I should, I should clarify that. It's not I me. kind of assumed, but I was just hoping you were like, yeah, I'm going to go get him. Shelby's <laughs> really got a missing tooth. That's a fake one right there. <laughs> right. Well, if it's anything like other kids sports, it's uh, crazier in the stands than it is on the ice anyway. So. Parents literally get kicked out. Yeah. 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 Hey, so I've got a business proposition for you. We'll talk more about it offline, but imagine this poly serial engineer. Oh, I love it. Many cereals, combining them into interesting new flavor <laughs> combinations. We'll talk about that later. And uh, if any of you are looking to uh, build one of your pillars investment, uh, reach out to me for Paula Serial Engineer investing opportunities. Oh, uh, yeah, that's perfect. You got the tagline. We got the vision going. I can see it. It's like a Slurpee machine. But cereal, you just pull the levers and then out the bottom comes whatever you could imagine. And we can have like guest curators like, uh, you know, Ingve Ingve Malmsteen, the amazing guitarist cereal combination or Shelby's uh, down home country cereal combination of <laughs> generic store brand flavors. <laughs> Nailed it. Nailed it. Is there a oh, subscription? Man. Like, sure. Okay. Yeah. We'll have to figure out what that's mm -hmm. going to cost. Different flavors of milk, maybe? Oh, we got to go. Oh, it's time. <laughs> yeah. See, I get involved and it's time to go. <laughs> yeah, you were the one, you were the one, uh, le Leandering. Uh, <laughs> le railing. Le railing. I like Leandering. <laughs> leandering. You were Leandering. I often leandering. Yeah. <laughs> hey, well, anyways, Lee, Shelby, I really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for having me on here. I hope that what I was able to share is, can inspire some people to just um, move the needle a little bit more, get on that journey of finding financial freedom. And you guys are doing an awesome thing. And I appreciate you. Thank you, Matt. It, it means a lot to us that you come on and how much you believe in us even means so much more. Um, but I think your words and the steps that you took us through is going to be very impactful, not only for us, because again, we're still trying to learn all this stuff, but even for our listeners. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. All right. Awesome. Thank you guys. Hey, thank you for coming to the party. If you had a good time and want to party more, subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review. If you want to humor us with your suggestions, questions, and confessions, go to moneypartypodcast.com and dial into the party hotline. While you're there, you can also request to be a guest on our show. Find us at Money Party Podcast on Instagram and moneypartypodcast.com. If you'd like to connect with Matt and start working on the eight steps, click on the show notes for access. Mm -hmm.